this problem, this quandary had happened before. As once before in the days of the Savior, that the priests of the church had become wicked persons and were using their lawful authority for unlawful ends. And obviously the light went on. This led John Huss to adopt for his own guidance and to preach to others for theirs, this is it, the maxim that the precepts of scriptures convey through the understanding are to rule the conscience. In other words, that God speaking in the Bible and not the church speaking through the priesthood is the one infallible guide. Did you get that? Can you say amen then? Amen. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, that principle, by the way, still applies today, does it not? And it always will do. And if we are going to be Protestants, like the, the word Protestant wasn't even invented in this day, understand? That came a little later on during Luther's time in the protest of the princes. But if we are going to be Husses or Luthers or not big names, but just ordinary people who love Jesus and want to serve him, whatever the cost, we have got to be led by this same principle. And I kid you not, that test is going to come around again to each one of us sooner than what we realize. So, Hus goes back to uh, the Bethlehem Chapel and he starts preaching again about what is going on here. And of course, uh, he got the blame, of course, uh, like Elijah of old, Hus was accused of being the troubler of Israel. And uh, once again, Prague was placed under interdict. Another thing I should mention at this time, there were three individuals claiming to be the Pope. Three of them, yes. Um, and each one, okay, so, so you got three of them. One of them would, would say, I'm the Pope, and the other two, they're anti-Popes. And the other one would say, no, I'm the Pope, and the other two are anti-Popes. And the other one would say, no, I'm the Pope, and the other two are anti-Pope. So we had that three, three, three men claiming to, to be the Pope. So each one of these men needed to raise funds to, pray for, to pay for mercenaries, for soldiers, to fight for their cause against the other two, you see. Um, uh, and so what the church did, so what these individuals did, they started selling blessings for money. You know, here's a blessing, give me uh, shekels and... Uh, that's nothing new. Uh, in fact, not to get too much off track, but in 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the door of the church in Wittenberg, his main beef that he was contending with was the sale of indulgences, which is pretty much the same. In other words, you pay for an indulgence, you, pay for your sin, you can pay and have your sins absolved. You can pay and uh, you know, you'll be in good shape with God. So here was something that was very, very similar. So. He did not like the idea of this, rightly so. And so he preached again. And, and so for the second time, Prague was placed under interdict. So what did Hus do? He left, never to return to the Bethlehem Chapel. He didn't come back. But nonetheless, at the same time, thereabouts, the church called a, ba a major church council in the town of Constance. And the chief objective of this, remember there's three popes contending to be popes and other stuff going on. The chief object of this, of this church council meeting here was to heal the divisions in the church and root out heresy. Those striving for the leadership of the church were expected to be present and so was John Huss, who was the leader, the propagator of the new opinions. He was expected to be there as well. Now, Huss was promised a safe conduct to Constance and back. But he knew he was still uh, risking his life if he was going to do that. But nonetheless, he went to Constance, he was taken, and he was thrown into a filthy dungeon. Now, back in his home country of Bohemia, there was an uproar. Huss was given a safe passage to Constance and back. 
What happened? Well, the reply they got back from the papacy is this, and I quote from another historian, uh, Jacques Lafont. Uh, the answer was this from the church. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy, though they are furnished with safe conduct from the emperor and king. So even though they're furnished with a safe conduct, uh, we don't have to respect that. Talk about treachery. So John Huss was thrown into this dark, foul dungeon, filthy vermin. You can imagine what it must have been like. He became very sick, became very feeble. Finally, after a period of time, he was finally brought out to stand before the council in chains to answer for the charges that had been placed against him. During his time confined to the dungeon, however, or during his long trial, he maintained his position to the truth. He would not back down. And he uttered his solemn protest faithfully against the corruptions of the church. Yet during those long weeks of suffering, when he would go back to his dungeon every night, this faithful, weakened, sick martyr of God, he still had a peace in his heart that nothing could snatch away. And but days before his life finally ended, and it was, he wrote these words to a friend, and I quote, I write this letter, he said, in my prison and with my fettered hand, expecting my sentence of death tomorrow when with the assistance of Jesus Christ, we shall meet again in the delicious peace of the future life. You will learn how merciful God has shown himself toward me, how effectually he has supported me in the midst of my temptations and trials. To have the courage like that, sitting in a filthy dungeon, spent yet not spent, feeling your earthliness and your weakness, but feeling yourself cradled in the arms of Jesus who holds you strong in the face of a power that he knows as the power to humanly just crush him. But what a man of God he held firm. And so on July the 6th, 1415, John Haas was led unceremoniously out tied to the stake, and uh, the wood was placed around him. The executioner came to the back and set the, the wood burning, and that man, although he smelt the smoke and finally felt the heat, he was faithful to the end. He declared these words. He said, most joyfully will I confirm with my blood that truth which I have written and preached. And when the flames kindled around him, he sang, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And he continued to sing until his voice was silenced forever on this earth. But that voice will sing again one day around the throne of him who gave his life for him and the one who in turn John Huss laid down his life to honor. So there was so much for John Huss. I'm going to take a bit of time, not too much longer if you don't mind. I want to, I want to bring in Jerome because this man, it's just as inspiring. So Jerome, he'd followed Huss to Constance, right? He, he was kind of nervous for his friend. He, he, he feared the worst and uh, he had no safe conduct, but he still he went to Constance. Of course, a safe conduct or not, it wasn't worth anything, was it? So he followed his friend John Huss to Constance. He couldn't help Huss, he just felt so helpless, and he's getting ready to leave, and they grab him. And he's arrested as well as Jerome, and is thrown into prison. Now, because of the uproar that had uh, arisen in Bohemia, and probably had spread around through some of the other countries, I would imagine, the uproar against John Huss's uh, safe passage being violated, the papacy decided that they should probably act a little more carefully. 
So they didn't come right out and say, we're going to have you, have you uh, detract your beliefs or we're going to burn you at the stake. They didn't say that. They thought they'd try and persuade him, okay? So they thought they'd try to be a little bit more slow perhaps and uh, not force him so much. But that was their plan. But I can tell you up front, it didn't work. So here we find our good friend Jerome, and he's brought before the assembly. And he's offered the opportunity to recant, to retract. Now, it would actually have been a merciful thing if the poor dear man had died just in the dungeon in the early days of this debacle that took place here, this shameful thing, but he didn't. He, he, he stayed alive, but it would have been merciful had he gone to sleep. But he was locked away. Time goes by, and uh, he's now weakened with the illness, hardships, and everything else. But he goes up into the council, and um, he, he, he feels really, really bad because, because of the suffering, he's disheartened by the death of Hoss, and he's just downcast, and his fortitude finally just, just gives way. And he's brought up before the council, and there he is, the poor man, and it's put to him, Jerome, do you this day, do you this day deny what your friend John Huss stood for? Do you deny the writings of John Wycliffe? Yes or no? What is your choice? Jerome, you can save your life. You don't have to go through this terrible suffering. Well, his spirit was about broken. And you know what he did? He caved. He caved. He gave in. But they didn't let him loose. They wanted more from him. They wanted a more stronger uh, recantation, if you will, and they stuck him back in that filthy dungeon. Imagine how he must have felt. So he's back in the dungeon now. And he's sitting there contemplating what he's done. He just pledged allegiance to the state church. He accepted the actions of the council previously in condemning his friend John Huss and also condemning Whitcliffe. Imagine how this man must have felt, but he was broken. But by this action of denying Huss and Whitcliffe, he had violated his conscience. And as he sat there in the dampness of his cell, this feeling of just total depression uh, just came over him. He thought perhaps he could escape his doom by denying his master, and above all else, his master that died for him. But in the solitude of that dungeon, it really dawned on him what, we, what he had done. Matthew 10, 33, Jesus says, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. That must have rung through his brain and cut through his heart. He thought about the faithfulness of his friend John Huss. And in contrast, he, he, he pondered his own denial of truth and his cowardliness. And he thought about his divine master that he had denied. He who had endured the cross for him. So imagine how he must have felt. Before his retraction, he too found comfort in his sufferings. Now that comfort was gone. And his soul was just tortured as he sat in the dark. And he knew if he continued on this path, he knew they were going to bring him up again and get a more stronger retraction from him. And he knew if he continued on this path, it would be complete apostasy. And he would not only lose his own soul, but the shame he would bring upon his Savior. So there, in the darkness of that dungeon, this poor dear man, 
he came to the decision to escape his sufferings, he would no longer deny his Lord. In other words, he would not be able to escape his sufferings. And he made his decision that he would not deny his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Neither deny Huss who had gone before, nor Whitcliffe who had lit this fire that had come over to his home country of Bohemia. And he knew that they would really pressure him now, but his decision was made. He was determined to avow his faith in the truth. And if necessary, he said to himself, I will go to the stake by the grace of God. So he comes up before the council and he renounces his former denial of truth. And he asks permission to make his own defense well, you know, they were fearful. They didn't want this man here being able to speak to the whole assembly. You know, they didn't want another Apostle Paul that would make his plea to those who were after his blood. They, they try to silence. It's a natural thing. It's not good uh, propaganda tactics to let your enemy be able to do their spiel in front of everybody when you know you're wrong. But he pled. He said, I have a right to be able to present my own defense. And so believe it or not, they actually allowed him to speak. And they must have been sitting on the edge of their seats. That's all I can say. So this dear man, he got down upon his knees in front of this great assembly with the sparkling crowns and the herbs, sorry, the robes with the ermine and the big ring these power brokers of this powerful church, this humble servant of God, sank to his knees. And in the presence of the judges and everybody there, he asked God, and I imagine he asked it just like a little child. He asked God to give him the Holy Spirit to control his words and his thoughts and to say or express nothing that would be contrary to the truth or unworthy of his dear master that laid down his life for him. Then rising to his feet, he began to speak with such power and eloquence it excited the astonishment and the amazement and even the admiration of his enemies. He'd been kept a whole year in a filthy, stinking dungeon unable to read, kept in the dark, suffering great mental torment, physical torment. And yet he stood there and he spoke with a clearness and a clarity as though he'd had his books and he'd been able to feed upon them for a whole year. He'd had nothing, but the Spirit of God came upon this man and he spoke in a way that just shook that assembly. And he, at the previous retraction, he assented to the church's sentence in condemning John Huss. And he declared his disagreement of having done this. And he bore witness to the innocence of Huss. And I quote here. Speaking of Huss, he said, I knew him from childhood. He was a most excellent man, just and holy. He was condemned notwithstanding his innocence. I also... I also am ready to die. I will not recoil from the torments that are prepared for me by my enemies and false witnesses who will one day have to render an account for their impostures before the great God with whom they cannot deceive. In self-reproach of what he had done, he continued, for all the sins that I have committed since my youth, None weigh so heavily upon my mind and cause me such remorse as that which I committed in this fatal place when I approved the iniquitous sentence rendered against the holy martyr John Huss, my master and my friend. Yes, I confess from my heart and declare with horror that I disgracefully quailed when through a dread of death I condemned their doctrines. I therefore supplicate Almighty God to pardon me my sins, and this one in particular, the most heinous of all. Then he turned to the judges. You can read this in the chapter, Great Conservate. He looked at these judges. 
He says, you condemned Wycliffe and John Huss not for having shaken the doctrines of the church because they branded with reprobation the scandals of the clergy, the pomp, the pride, the vices of the, the, the prelates and the priests. These things which they have affirmed and which are irrefutable, I also think and declare them likewise. There must have been a hush in that room and yet an intensity of the power of the Holy Spirit. But yet working from beneath was another spirit. And those prelates, those that were covered with the pomp and circumstance of their own self-importance, suddenly they were filled with anger and seething rage. And they said, away with him. And they took him and they put him back in that filthy dungeon. But you know what? You can be sure that that humble man of God, when he hit the floor, that filthy floor in that dungeon, he must have had a peace in his heart that he would not have sold for all the treasure in this world. Finally, he too, was sentenced. On May the 30th, 1416, Jerome, bless his heart, was led out to the very same place where his friend John Huss had yielded up his life. But his face was a portrait of peace and joy. You see, the devil never understands that. How he, does, how he does his worst to the children of God. He even tries to put them to death, and he does. But it's an incredible, unfathomable mystery how he sees that these people that he's going to physically destroy, they have a joy and a peace that nothing can buy. So he walks out with a joy and peace on his face, and he's singing, can you say Amen. He's seeing to him, his gaze was fixed upon Jesus and death had lost its terrors. And so there he is, they, they put their wood around him. And there's this man, he's seeing, he's supposed to be scared to death, right? But he's singing and he's filled with joy and they put the wood around him. And the executioner comes behind him. They always lit the fire from behind because they knew it would be too much to see them light in the fire right before your face. The executioner comes behind him. What does Jerome say? He says, come to the front and light it here before my face. If I was afraid, I wouldn't be here. So the executioner comes around and he lights the flame. And the flames rose about him with a prayer on his lips we don't know how long he suffered for, but all we know is this. He gave up his life, a conqueror. He gave up his life, a champion of Jesus Christ, just like his master before him, and was walking joyfully in the footsteps of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Was that life taken in vain when he was reduced to ashes, just like Wycliffe's bones were? No. Was his life taken in vain because his bones were reduced to ashes, just like John Huss? No. It was not in vain, because even though the fire went out, there was a fire kindled in the heart of his countrymen. The faithful in Bohemia, I don't have time today, but you can read what happened. The Hussites, they went to war with the papacy. And they won some amazing battles, but that's for another day. But his faithful friends, those who had been inspired by this, this man, the, the faithful Bohemians, they held firm to the truth. And they looked by faith to a better day. And that day began to dawn over a hundred years later, when a monk by the name of Martin Luther in 1517, nailed this thesis to the door of the church in Wittenberg, and the tidal wave of the Reformation just came rolling in. You know, the final work of what these reformers began, it's not finished yet. 
You know that, don't you? It's far from finished. The church of the dark ages, in conjunction with political, religious sentiments in this country, they're going to restructure a lot of things, just like in the dark ages. There's going to be the image to the beast. And those who stand against it are going to need the courage of a Whitcliffe, a John Huss, a Jerome, and so many others who went before them because they're going to have to stand on this word and this word alone. That's going to be a lot. That's going to be our lot. This may be our last Christmas. The last events will be rapid ones. May we all be ready. May we be ready, surrendered even now, today. Amen. And may today, as we give our hearts and lives to Jesus, let us ask him to fill us with the faith of the martyrs who went before. May we be inspired by those who went before because there may be some of us in this room that may be called to make the same sacrifice if it's necessary in the whole process of getting this message finally to the world. And above all else, may the courage and example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who laid down his life for us all upon the cross and the sufferings that he went through, we will never, never plumb the depths of understanding, trying to able, be able to grasp the magnitude of all of that. He tasted death for every man, woman, and child. Let us be thankful. And let us in turn give our hearts to him, who though could have gone back to heaven and left us, decided that he would not turn around until he had finished what he came to this earth to complete, to save us, to love us, to set us on fire with his love and send us out to tell a dying world of the Savior who is filled with love and grace and wants to save us all. So may God, may God keep us faith. I just hope this story uh, brings you some inspiration. Um, we need it, right?